Hello. When you have a digital circuit you'd like to get running, one approach is to sketch up a design and prototype it, say on a breadboard. But to get started, you'll need all the components to wire it up correctly, and then you can write up some code if you've got a microcontroller and get that installed. And that's a lot of steps, uncertainties, and time cycling through the development loop. It could be a lot simpler and faster to get a simulation running instead, to test and tweak things on a computer before busting out the jumper wires. Now, most projects I design for the real world involve a microcontroller and a number of peripheral chips. Each MCU has its own best way of simulating it, but the real sticking point is those peripherals. To get a simulation going, you need to find a way to model those as well, and then get all the pieces connected and speaking to each other. Now, today I'm going to show you an easy way to do all this with Wokwi, an integrated system to run simulation that supports MCUs you're probably using, has a number of peripherals built in, but also allows you to define any custom chip chips to use in your projects. We'll start really simple and work up through a couple of interesting projects. So let's start a new project. On the homepage there are a lot of choices to start from, but uh, for something really basic like this I like to use a new blank, then I save a copy for my own use. Okay, what we're going to do is implement a custom chip, uh, one that just counts clicks and shows us visually. So I'm going to have a button, and to keep part count down just use a bar graph. Now all I need is our custom chip, so add custom chip. Use the recommended C API and call it very originally test. So two files are added to the project, a JSON file that describes the chip and a C source file to implement it. Inside the JSON, the pin array defines the number of pins and their naming. So I'll replace that with in one, two, three, four, now you can see the breakout has changed to match this. The order determines the pin number here. So uh, the first one is pin one, etc. If you want to skip a number, you can just add empty strings. This can let you ensure your custom chip matches any real life I see you're modeling. Okay, that looks good. Now the really interesting part is the implementation. This is where the magic happens. The implementation file has some boilerplate to help you. Everything of interest will be happening in callback, so the chip state structure is where we'll stash our state information. The chip in it is, you guessed it, where we initialize everything. So let's code something up. Let's say I want to count up to four, uh, the number of output pins I set in the JSON. So I'm going to want to keep track of the current count. So I'll stick that in the chip state structure. A u and 8 since it's a small value. I'll also be playing with uh, those output pins, so let's keep an array of these, uh, which will be pin type things. Really just an int, but this is clean. Okay, on to the init. In here we do all our setup. I don't like repeating myself, so I create an array of all the output names, initialize each pin as an output, and stash the return reference ID thing uh, for this output in my state. We also have an input, so let's initialize that. Get a handle to that pin while initializing it as an input with a pull down, so it's low by default. Okay, so those outputs are simple beasts. Uh, we'll just be writing to them whenever we want. But the input is something else. We don't know when that'll come in, so we need to treat it differently. The documentation shows all the details, and I'll use that as a starting point. And now we tell the system we want to watch it. For this, we create a watch config structure. We want to monitor rising edge events. We want to call input changed whenever that happens, and that will get our chip structure as the user data. Now all we need to do is call pin watch uh, with this pin and config. And this won't build, however, because we still need the callback. Okay, so we called that input changed. We get handed the user data, but the system doesn't have a clue what that is, so we cast it uh, old school C style to our chip state. So every time this gets called, the user pushed the button. We're going to up the count, modulo the number of outputs, uh, reset all the outputs to off, and set the output for the current count high if it's between one and four. Okay, our counter. Notice I put a printf statement as a breadcrumb to see what's happening. Just don't forget the new line slash n or you won't see anything because buffer. Reset all outputs, we use pin write to set them low. And here if the chip count is between one and four, we write high on the appropriate output. 
guess we should wire this up. So something you may notice here is that I'm not actually powering this chip and there's no current limiting to the LEDs. In real life, that would kill them. But Wacwee is pretty forgiving in this regard. In a real chip model, I'd add power pins and current limiting just out of principle and to future proof things, uh, but you don't have to. Okay, we've got a test chip in a circuit. Let's give it a go. Well, that's kind of working. In fact, it looks more like we're rolling dice than counting. You can see that every time I click, the count jumps through multiple steps. So this is a consequence of Wacwee actually modeling the push button pretty nicely. In real life, these springy things bounce around and uh, cause a bunch of triggers. I like the realism, but here we don't need it, so I'm going to set this attribute to zero in the JSON definition for the push button. Side note, though I tend to play in the JSON directly, this can be changed easily through the GUI. Okay, if we run this, noise. So there you have our first custom chip running. Okay, now let's do a real chip. Say I have a project with the venerable 4511, which takes a nibble in and drives a seven segment display. Okay, there are a lot of these and any data sheet will do, but there's a nice description on buildelectronics.com. So it takes four bits and will deal with driving a seven segment display. Another new blank project will have a seven segment display a dip switch for the inputs, and a custom chip. Okay, set up the pins so they match the real chip. The resulting custom chip looks like this now. Okay, one more little tweak and I can wire this up. That seven segment display needs to be common cathode, so I'm going to set that in the parts attributes. Let's wire it up. Okay, so I've made this more colorful to clarify things. The first four switches on the dip are connected to the input bits in order. I've ignored the blank and test pins, but did tie the latch enable here. The seven segment is all wired up with A to A, etc. Okay, let's start implementing. For the state, we're going to be watching the inputs, playing with the outputs, and keeping track of whether the latching is enabled. Here I've set up a more interesting chip state structure. I put in arrays for the input output pins, separated out the control pins into substructure, and we'll keep track of the value from the in bits uh, in a single place called value. Let's init all this stuff. So I've got little loops to init and store the inputs outputs. Let's also keep track of the latch enable. Okay, we need to keep an eye on all these inputs. The latch enable is just like push button in the last example. And for the inputs, I'll just shoot them all over the same input change callback. Finally, I want to check the latch enable during init because Walkwee will keep my switch settings between runs and we can assume that it'll be low. Uh, but also low means enabled here, so we want to track that. So now I've set things up to use three functions that don't exist yet. Latch enable, input, change callbacks, and something to update the output segments. First, the input changed. So this is what our function looks like. I'm gonna keep things simple here and just read all the inputs on any change. So let's get the chip state so we can have all our pin handles. Here's a quick define that'll do the casting and chip star instantiation from the void user data. Okay, let's loop over all the pins and uh, read in the value. Finally, if it's enabled, let's use that update output function again. Time to actually define that. So here I've got an array that maps any number between 0 and F, 15, uh, to the segments we want on. I'm using this update output internally, so actually passing the chip state pointer around directly. We'll get the current value, get the segment mapping, and just turn on any segment that has a one set. Finally, let's do the latch enable change callback. It just sets the inverted logic enabled flag, and if it was just enabled, we'll update the output uh, right away. Let's give it a go. You can click the div switches, or when the part is selected, just use the keyboard. So that's looking good. Let's try latch enable. I set hide to disable. Change the input. Nothing happens. But when I stop disabling it, boom. Okay, I think we're good. Cool. So this is a realistic simulation of our chip, but setting that input one bit at a time is somewhat annoying. If you want to simplify things or have internal configuration state that you want to be able to tweak, custom chips also provide an easy way to do that. Controls. Controls provide attributes that you can set during the simulation. Let's say we want to be able to override the input value, so we'll define a control object in the JSON. With the simulation running, we can now see this control slider by clicking on the chip doesn't do anything yet though, so let's initialize this attribute and use it in the implementation. Inside our chip init, we'll get a handle to this attribute. 
Okay, to keep an eye on it this time, we'll use another custom chip feature, a timer. Like the pin watch, we init that with a uh, struct holding details. Here we'll have a manual value check callback. So init that and start her up. The 5000 is microseconds to a uh, timeout, so five milliseconds. And the true is whether this should be periodic and repeat, and we want that. Okay, so let's implement the check. Okay, get the current value with a read. Um, I still want the input pins to work, so let's only override this if the manual value has changed. So let's update the state. We need the attribute in there as well as the actual value. All right, so if it has been updated, we track that change, update the actual value recorded, and update the output. Let's try that out. Nice. That works, but doesn't impact actual function. Most interesting chips will have some way other than parallel bits to control them, but you don't want to be spending your time implementing low-level I2C drivers. Thankfully, the custom chips provide easy support for SPI, I2C, UART, even analog. UART is really easy to implement, but I'm currently working on this project. I made myself a little tool to suck the netlist from KiCad into Walkwee, and I'll talk about that later, but you can see this circuit has a W25Q32 custom chip here. That's a serial flash memory. I'd like to support that chip, and it uses SPI. Focusing on developing just that IC, we'll use an MCU to control the device and begin by implementing a simple little client custom chip that speaks through SPI to get things going. Okay, so we've got our chip set up with various pins, and in the implementation, the first thing we're going to want to do is keep an eye on the chip select, so let's add that to the chip state structure. We'll also need a handle to the SPI device and a buffer for that, so I add these. In the init, we get our chip select and set up the watch for chip select pin, as we've done before. The SPI configuration in it looks similar to everything we've done before, but it has a few more attributes, basically to tell it which pins to use as clock, meso, mozzie, uh, plus the mode. Now the callback here is called done, and that's an indication of something important. Uh, so we init that, implement these callbacks. I create a little uh, utility function to tell me if the uh, CS is asserted, it's inverted logic. Now in the select changed, if this chip is actually selected, then we call SPI start to trigger reception transmission. We pass that the SPI device handle, the buffer, and the number of bytes to receive and send. Now if the chip isn't selected, well the CS just changed, so it must mean that we've been selected before, so we call SPI stop. Now every time CS goes low, we're going to start receiving a single byte. Once that has actually come in, the done callback will be triggered, so let's do that. Uh, so first thing, this gets called after stop too. If that's the case, count is zero here, uh, so we just return. Okay, we're done. Okay, we got a byte. Now, I'm not gonna care about it, except uh, to print it out just right now. Um, but what, what are we sending back? Uh, let's put in a next response function to do that later. Finally, and this is important, if we're still selected, call start again to ensure that we get the next byte. Okay, last thing is to actually write the next response function. Uh, I'll keep track of how many bytes we've processed already and just shoot back the next character in some arbitrary string. Yeah. So that should do it for our device. Now we need to drive this. Uh, so in an INO file, a basic Arduino thing, in the setup we want to have the chip select as an output and not have the chip selected yet, so write a high. And in the loop we'll just select, transfer a number of characters, and spit out what we got back from the chip. Let's try this out. Okay, that's looking pretty good. The driver is getting back the responses, and on the chip side, one, two, three, four, five, six is indeed being received. <laughs> nice. Now that we have both sides talking with each other over SPI, it just becomes a matter of implementing the actual API of the chip itself. If you want to try it out, check out the documentation, which contains a number of samples, and the examples shown here are all linked in the description. That should be enough to get you started with your own custom chips, so you can head to walkwee.com right now and try it out. In the next video, I think I'll dive into actually implementing a non-trivial custom chip, probably using I2C, so stay tuned for that. Have fun. Thanks for watching.